and I think that we have to overcome the the age-old prejudices against people with disabilities and realize that we're entering into an era now where uh, these people can be fully employed. Getting the employment message across at a conference on disability and work. Hello and welcome to DNET, the Disability Network. I'm Joe Coughlin. The recession has made it much more difficult for people with disabilities to find jobs. An employer can simply say to a disabled job applicant, look, how can I hire you when I'm laying off people and might be out of business in a month's time? Employment equity is great, but the truth is, I can't afford it. It sounds plausible, but in some cases, employers are suspected of using the recession as a great excuse not to hire people with disabilities. All of this does not make life easier for organizations and agencies whose job it is to help people with disabilities find work. Remember that over half the disabled population in Canada is unemployed. The Recession Blues dominated a conference held recently in Toronto by one of these organizations, the Winnipeg-based Canadian Council on Rehabilitation and Work, the CCRW. The conference theme, Strengthening Partnerships, New Patterns in Employment and Disability, reflects the mandate of the CCRW, that is, to work with employers, unions, specialized agencies, and others to facilitate the training and employment of people with disabilities. And who represent, I think, a very uh, uh, valid cross-section of, uh, of perspectives and... A star attraction was Richard Pimentel. Brought here from California to facilitate panel discussions, Pimentel is the key author and trainer of the Windmills Attitudinal Training Program offered to employers in the U.S. and Canada. Now, one of the things I did want to say is that you'll notice that there's a sign language interpreter sitting at the table, and I've, I've talked to them before the session, and I've, I've told them some of my funnier jokes. Uh, and I told them that if the panel and I become too boring to sign, to simply sign some of those jokes. Panelist Derek Fudge is with the National Union for Public and Government Employees. He took the opportunity to remind the audience that Max Yaldin, head of the Canadian Human Rights Commission, had called the voluntary federal employment equity law a failure. Companies have not, uh, have not uh, uh, achieved a very high targets at all. Uh, and basically, the, 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 uh, he, uh, he summarized it by saying, you know, the reason why is voluntary. I mean, employers don't have to. It's nice. All they have to do is send in a report. Well, that's not employment equity legislation. There has to be a mandatory commitment to uh, employment equity. And I, I, so I think our governments have a major role in putting forth the legislative framework and the social policy framework which enhances employers and unions' abilities to work together to create uh, employment opportunities for persons with disabilities. Pat, as an employer, I have a question for you. I come to you, I have a disability. I'm in the interview. I go out of my way to make you feel comfortable with my disability. Mention it, uh, invite you to talk about it, keep it relevant to my ability to do the job, not how I got it or how I feel about it, but that. Have I increased or decreased my chances of being offered the job? I believe that you've increased your, or your chances of getting the job. I think there are statistics that say that in an interview, if the disability is not talked about, you will not get the job. And the physical barriers aren't the, aren't the things that are stopping people from employment. It's the societal and attitudinal barriers. And those take a lot longer to break down. I hate to throw this at you, Tom, but I, you really are one of the, 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 the people representing here that's real doing hands-on service providing here. Has rehab failed, uh, not in representing people with disabilities, but has rehab failed to teach people with disabilities to represent themselves? Unfortunately, uh, in Canada anyway, I'm not sure in, in the States, but in Canada, the rehab uh, system is very much uh, still very much medically based. In other words, the premise is that you as, as someone with a disability are like a broken machine, and thank God you came to us because we can fix it. Uh, so we'll work with you, we'll work on you, uh, and by the time you leave here, you'll be better. 
we'll fix you. And if we can't fix you, that means there's something really wrong with you. Steve Mannis is with the Canadian Injured Workers Alliance. He told delegates that many employers still have an unenlightened attitude toward workers who experience a disability on the job and attempt to return to work. Uh, we have heard over and over again the story that the doctor says, okay, you're ready to go back to work to light modified duty. You take your slip of paper back to the employer and the employer says, hey, if you ain't 100%, don't come back. That is not an enlightened attitude. Uh, that is saying, uh, you know, uh, we're going to hire that person who's 100% before we're going to hire you because you're only 75 or 80. And we see that over and over and over again. I think we have to understand where we're coming from. And uh, when I, I talk to the disabled community, I say to them, Let, let's compare ourselves to the women's movement and what the women's movement did. And, and how they had to go through a conscious raising experience themselves. I mean, let's face it, we were brought up as fairly passive individuals. We were brought up as individuals. I mean, let's go back a couple of uh, centuries. We were uh, sort of thrown away in asylums. You know, the main uh, philosophy behind us is out of sight, out of mind. You know, the medical model needs to be taken care of. And that, that, that type of philanthropy, that type of philosophical direction in terms of, of treating disabled people still exists. When we come back, the patron of the Canadian Council on Rehabilitation and Work will tell us what he believes is the biggest barrier facing people with disabilities. <laughs> the employment conference in Toronto was opened by the organization's patron, the Governor General Raina Titian. After a speech and after watching a display of a new accessible computer system, he told me what he considers a major barrier facing Canadians who are disabled. I think it's uh, the question of getting employment, a meaningful employment. Um, in my humble estimation, uh, you won't find a more motivated, uh, more determined group of people and people who have to uh, fight against uh, serious disability. They're focused, they're anxious, they're ambitious, and they're good. Uh, and I think that we have to overcome the, the age-old prejudices against people with disabilities and realize that we're entering into an era now where uh, these people can be fully employed. Uh, the uh, computer, the microchip, has really done marvelous things for opportunities. Uh, and it's non-discriminatory. Uh, it, uh, it only produces the product. And I think this is uh, really uh, augurs well for the future. But to be honest with you, that is the obstacle, I think, as far as uh, disability is concerned, is just the opportunity to participate, like every other Canadian citizen, in, in full employment and employment that is satisfying. At this conference, there seems to be a fairly interesting cross-representation of business, industry, and government. What is your message to these people to ensure people with disabilities get a chance to participate? Well, I'm impressed with the quality of people that are attending this function, whether they be from corporations, whether they're from government, whether they're caregivers, or people who have suffered disability themselves. I guess my message is that uh, they should really work towards enhancing their networking in order to provide the jobs that I think are essential for people with disabilities. And if, if they make progress in this area, they really have accomplished a great deal. I find now that for most groups that I meet, uh, that there is a real uh, good intention involved in getting people with disabilities involved in their projects. We have a long way to go. I mean, this is not perfection by any means, but I think people uh, have to be reminded. Uh, I think your program, for example, is an excellent vehicle to remind people that we have a terrific capacity, terrific capability with uh, people who have some disability. But we all have disabilities. As I said this morning, all of us who wear glasses, uh, all of us who've had uh, an operation or hip replacement or uh, some uh, difficulty, we're, so we all face this kind of situation in life. And we should remember that 
and make sure that we're all treated equally in the society. That's our objective. The high-tech computer the Governor General was looking at was operated by Debbie Donald of Toronto. Donald's situation exemplified what the conference was all about. She fought a successful battle to get out of hospitals and institutions to live on her own. She has taken several computer courses, but nobody will offer her a job. I have been totally unsuccessful after graduating in 1990, and I am losing my skills, and it's not fair, because there's no reason why an office cannot be set up like this, and I don't have to be government dependent. I could be out there working. I'm trained for it, and it's just, just it's frustrating. <laughs> Getting to this conference in a downtown Toronto hotel was not a problem for most of the participants. Although the hotel was not as accessible as it likes to think it is. Something that can happen when a conference is run by people who are not disabled. Along with wheelchair users, the only way I could reach the conference rooms upstairs was by freight elevator. As for Debbie Donald, she almost didn't make it. And it is yet another example of an obstacle that many people with disabilities face. As she is required to do, she booked her ride on the accessible Wheeltrans bus four days before the conference. They called me the, the day before the conference, Wheeltrans, confirming my ride that they could not bring me here, they could not take me home. And this was important. I feel that if I have been faithful to book four days in advance, that the taxi should be subsidized because it was their lack of vehicles for me to come here or for whatever reason why they could not get me here so they the government should subsidize the cab the cab cost thirty dollars one way plus gst and pst to assure that i would get a ride in the morning and a ride home another thirty dollars plus gst pst and a tip and that amounts to around seventy dollars which i think is ridiculous especially if you book it that far in advance. Coming up next on this DNet employment special, Prime Minister Mulroney's point man on disability. Hi, nice to see you again. We've been bumping. As Secretary of State, Roberto Cotre appears to have earned the respect of many people in the disability community because of his grasp of the issues and because of his actions. He told the conference that the long-awaited omnibus legislation on disability rights would be tabled shortly in the House of Commons. However, none of this is worthwhile unless Canadians change their attitudes. We know that public and private employers often hesitate to hire a person with a disability. They think it'll cost too much, cause safety problems, or disruption in the workplace. We wouldn't have to introduce rights protections and employment equity legislation if people's attitudes were affirmative from the start. Following his speech, we invited the Secretary of State and three senior employment equity managers to talk about the role of the federal government in furthering the employment needs of people with disabilities. Marie Tellier is with the Canadian National Railway, and Mona Katani represents the Manitoba telephone system. Linda White of the Royal Bank of Canada would like to see unemployment insurance dollars redirected to training programs. Uh, I think to see those used to train people with disabilities to a greater extent than they are in joint programs with employers. Uh, we've been involved in a number of them, as, as have the others here, where people come into our workplaces and gain the skills if they're not job ready today. The community-based organizations administer them. We don't get involved with the government funding side of it, but clearly those community-based organizations have those capabilities and we can get involved by providing training and hire those people in a good many cases to meet our needs when they've come off the program successfully. Mr. Tocotre, is there any uh, training dollars that are available in the strategy, in the national strategy? Yes, very much so. And uh, Bernard Velcourt has uh, made an announcement uh, that uh, with, in cooperation with business, uh, that uh, a part of the uh, employment and training uh, budget of CIC will be allocated for people with disabilities. So that's part of the strategy. It's there. 
Uh, we need, uh, we still need the details, and we still have to work out some of the partnerships. But it's there; it's in place. Mr. Katani, from a regional perspective, do you see anything more coming from Ottawa for for people that are out there in the provinces? Well, a model that has worked very well for the Manitoba telephone system, and uh, it included a partnership between three levels of government, the federal government, the provincial government, and the municipal government, involved themselves in a core area training initiative. And because the three levels of government were, were funding the initiative, they were able to work with a broader perspective of employers, which included, in my case, Crown Corporations. And so you have a partnership working in partnership with employers in the mm -hmm. province. And the tone is different, the results are different, and, and it's an affirmative program right off, right off the hopper. That worked very well, and that's the kind of thing that, that we would like to be involved in more. We all hear about this huge gap between employers and people with disabilities, whereby you have one group of people wanting work and the other group of people having the jobs that may be open to these people. And the, the linkages aren't easy. Uh, and I would very much like to see the government, and I guess the CIC would be the body responsible for that, helping create those bridges, maybe the partnerships are the good word, between employers and the uh, groups working with people who have disabilities. Mr. Ducotre, people always want things from the government. What would you like from business? It's not so much what I would like uh, from business right now. It's uh, what government has to do, and it's not going to cost anything. We've got to engage in a, in a very major effort to change attitudes. Now, um, I'm speaking with business people today, and uh, I know they're very well aware of the issue and they're very sympathetic to the issue, but when you cross Canada from coast to coast and talk to business people, there still is a very major attitudinal problem to be, uh, to be addressed. And we can't do that with money. I mean, we can build access ramps, we can do all kinds of things like that, we can open the national parks uh, for people with handicaps, uh, we can we can work from that point of view on a physical basis, but if we're really going to, to start making progress on this issue, we've got to change attitudes. People in the business community and elsewhere in Canada have to understand that people with disabilities have an awful lot to contribute uh, and that we need their contribution and not be afraid of hiring somebody with a, with a disability. And, and that's the challenge. And how do we do that? Well, we have to do that through partnerships uh, with business, uh, with uh, the trade unions. We've also got to do it with the media. We need the media to help us in that. And now they're starting. Uh, I've, I've, had, uh, I've met with uh, 28 publishers over the last two months uh, to explain how they could contribute to uh, a social uh, development here. It has nothing to do with government, really. We have to take the lead as a government. But it's not government pro propaganda. It's a question of saying, well, we've got to go ahead, we've got to change, and you have got to play a role. The omnibus legislation that Robert de Cotre referred to in his speech to the CCRW conference is in some ways comparable to the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA. The ADA is revolutionizing the way people with disabilities are treated in the United States. When we come back, we will meet one of the fathers of the ADA. In 1990, on the lawn of the White House, U.S. President George Bush signed into law the Historic Americans with Disabilities Act. Sitting beside Bush was one of the key figures in getting the law on the statute books. He is Justin Dart, Jr., Chairman of the President's Committee on Employment for People with Disabilities. Dart was a featured speaker at the Toronto Conference. Afterwards, I talked with him about the lessons Canadian lawmakers and disability advocates could learn from the ADA. There is no such thing as partial equality. We tried that when we freed the slaves in America. We, we made them partly equal. You, you know, you're, you're equal in this area, but you can't go to the same bathroom, you can't go in the same restaurant. And, and we tried that for 100 years. It was a tragedy. And everybody in the world is, uh, is familiar with it. There is no such thing as partial uh, equality. When, when you legislate partial equality, what you're doing is by implication is you're legalizing inequality. You're legalizing discrimination in the areas that you leave out. So I would strongly urge that, that uh, uh, Canada uh, have a, a, a law 
uh, pass a, a civil rights law for people with disabilities that is true to the principle of equality in every area uh, of society. And, and when compromises needed to be made, and, and they do need to be made, uh, they, they would, should be in the area of giving people time to make a transition to an accessible society uh, to solve problems that have taken thousands of years to, 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 to create. And, and, and giving, uh, uh, being, being patient with that transition as opposed to exempting areas of, of society from the requirement of equality, which, which is uh, uh, simply uh, legislates, discrim uh, legalizes discrimination. Um, you're a unique person. Uh, the, the thing that I find... Every person is unique. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, here we have a person that's got something to do with disability and uh, has a fairly powerful position in, in a very powerful country, and uh, you have a disability. I mean, that's kind of odd for us to see somebody in that kind of uh, a position. How do we get more people with disabilities in positions like yours that have influence in, in the ears of, of the leaders in the government? Well, I think it doesn't happen by accident. Uh, it, it, it requires uh, advocacy. I don't think any paternalistic or authoritarian establish, establishment uh, uh, ever voluntarily handed down equality. And equality is always achieved uh, by the, the, the minority, the oppressed people uh, demanding participation, uh, not only economic participation and and, and participation in the democratic process in the terms that they, in the sense that they vote, uh, but uh, participation in, in, in government and in leadership in both the government and the private sector. Uh, I, I don't think there's any such thing as, as, as equality uh, being uh, uh, given uh, paternalistically. They, they tried that in the Soviet Union for 70 years. Just doesn't work. Justin Dart gave an electrifying speech when he appeared before the Toronto conference. Important messages were delivered by other conference participants. And guess what? No representatives of the media bothered to show up, even though 16 of them were invited. Karen Lowen was given the job of contacting the media in advance of the conference. I think that disability issues are generally ignored by the mainstream media unless it's a a high-profile story like uh, that woman who uh, wanted the right to end her life, you know, things like that. Um, um, anything short of that isn't worthy of media attention, it seems, um, which is a real shame. And I, you know, I hope that will change with time, but uh, it doesn't seem to be changing yet. Actually, as we found out later, a reporter photographer from the Toronto Star did show up but managed to get the story all wrong. The reporter's only interest was in the Governor General and the high-tech computer operated by Debbie Donald. He or she, the story is not signed, called it incorrectly, of course, the Conference of Special Technology for People with Disabilities. And there was no mention whatsoever of what the conference was really about. Another example, you might say, of the mainstream media's fascination with the high-tech side of disability at the expense of people and issues. I'm Joe Coughlin. I hope you enjoyed this special report on the Conference on Strengthening Partnerships, organized by the Winnipeg-based Canadian Council on Rehabilitation and Work. If you have any comments, write to us at Disability Network, CBC, Box 500, Station 8 Toronto, M5W1E6. That's Disability Network, CBC, Post Office Box 500, Station 8 Toronto, M5W1E6 or you can fax us at area code 416-975-5636. Calling about your ad in the paper? Yes, I can start right away. I should tell you I'm disabled. Oh, I understand. <laughs>